you're here listening to this because you want to be the best you can be. You're excited to grow, to develop, and get ahead. You believe you are special and that you have something unique to offer to this world. You're just not sure what that is or how to cultivate it. This is not about having all the answers, but hopefully by sharing some of the experiences, successes, and failures of both myself and the guests on the show, you'll be able to discover more about that special something that makes you tick. This is the Sarah Brinson Podcast on IDTV. We are back in 2019 with weekly episodes, brand new guests, and loads of insight into the careers of some badass ladies who are not only extremely talented, creative, and uber successful, but genuinely kind people who truly care. Today's guest is the amazing and talented Natasha Chandel. She is a multi-hyphenate like myself, executive producer, comedy writer, actress, and fellow podcast host for the incredible Kinda Dating. This episode, I got the opportunity to sit down with her and learn more about her journey and how she came to be who she is today. From her first job to her experience in LA, as well as what she learned along the way. A fantastic kickoff to the new season of the podcast. You're all in for a treat. I'm so excited to hear more about your story. And I'd love to just kind of start back at the beginning, you know, post uh, high school. What what did you do? Did you go to college? Did you? Yeah, yeah, I went to, uh, I went to University of Ryerson. Actually, my foray into professional television and all of that actually started in high school. Um, I had my first job when I was 16 at Rogers Television uh, in Mississauga. And uh, I found out that there was a local station. And thankfully, my media teacher at the time was encouraging me to get into this. My parents wouldn't let me go to theater school, you know, like the very classic uh, Indian immigrant parent story. Um, And so I decided to focus my energy on learning everything else um, that had to do with production and producing. Um, And so I literally knocked on Roger's television door (laughs) uh, and uh, told them they should hire me. And they were like, yeah, no. Um, But the station manager saw me on the way out uh, and he was like, who is that girl? And he, and he, I think he just appreciated my boldness. And so he said, get her a job. And I wow. started as a teleprompter. And in the first week I moved to camera operator. And in a month I got promoted to floor director. And uh, at, I was at the age of six. 16. Yeah. I was wow. the youngest floor director um, for four live shows. And then uh, when I was 17, they encouraged me to get into reporting, which made me laugh because as much as I loved that stuff, I knew that at 17, I looked like I was 12, Um, (laughs) but but I did it anyways. And then my first story aired. Another producer from another Rogers, a senior producer, heard my story for whatever reason, felt um, it was very well written. And they asked me, at 17, (laughs) to uh, write a historical documentary on the 150th anniversary of Brampton, which is the sixth largest city in Canada. And again, I was like, what are you people doing? I'm 17 years old. Um, And they really, really championed and believed in me. I really don't know why, but they did. And a year of working on that, on top of my regular duties at Rogers. Um, I ended up not even realizing that I was producing or helping them produce it um, by arranging shoots and going to do interviews and doing all of that stuff. Uh, And then a year later, the documentary aired and I got my first um, writer and uh, associate producer credit. And so I was wow. time. Yeah. And that sort of set me off. And from there on, it was just that. So you went into university with clear a clear direction of wh- what you wanted to study and how you wanted to use it? Yeah. I mean, university for me was almost a, just a piece of paper because I had, right. there were there were only a handful of us. And funny enough, they're the only handful that have eventually moved to uh, America. We're actually all, uh, they actually recently moved here to LA, but there were only a handful of us who had already been working through school. 
So, or like through through uh, university. Um, so university for me was more about building the connections and using the internship and those kinds of things to do other projects I wanted to do. So instead of doing my internship at the regular Canadian networks, because I was already working at that point, right. um, even if they were just entry level jobs, but I was already working, I used my internship to go to uh, New York to work for MTV. Um, which Amazing. then sort of kickstarted me, my career uh, in America. And so this was the summer after your first year in university? No. So in university, I went to to Ryerson University. Yep. Um, shout out Rye High um, for radio and <laughs> arts. And uh, my first couple of years, we weren't allowed to do that. But I was just, I was okay. continuing my regular uh, working jobs Um I was working at Rogers. I was a publicist for a festival, and I was. Um, I ended up doing an internship when I did get to Ryerson at Fashion Television, and yeah. then uh, spent like a semester there, and ended up they ended up hiring me after, and so I was just sort of working just all these freelance gigs on everything. I I did every job that came to me. So it was talent assisting to production to gaffing to anything. I, I literally just, did it all. Yes, I'll be there. Yeah, because so, I wanted to learn everything. Yeah. And I have to ask this because it's a theme in these young people's lives. How much of that did you get paid for? Um, not a lot of it. Half of the stuff I got <laughs> paid for and half I didn't. Um, once I started yeah. working at like fashion television and stuff, I was getting paid for when I was doing CBC stuff. Some of the stuff I was getting paid for. Some of the stuff that came through university, I was not getting paid for. Because internships, especially back in that day, were unpaid. Now, right. I'm, I'm always like, wow, you guys get paid $15 an hour? <laughs> I'm like, man, I wonder what that was. You have no idea. I, yeah. like, I could have paid for so much of my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so you're like 20 probably at the time. You've ran a floor of four shows. You've produced and written a documentary. And now you're in New York City at MTV. Yeah, so at 20, I, I got my internship at at MTV, and uh, what well, was VH1, so it was MTV Networks, and I spent my first summer there. I turned 21, I got back, and I was like, all right, I'm going to move to New York and work for MTV. <laughs> and at that time, <laughs> it was like an unheard of thing to do because uh, visas and immigration and right. the type of visas that we qualify for in um, in media is not the regular TN. So it was like an O-1 visa. Right, and I remember being right. 21 and everybody just sort of patting me on the back being like, yeah, sure. Okay. And actually my agent at the time who was a big agent, but because I was so young, was actually told me, he goes, it's not going to happen. And I was like, wow. okay, cool. Well, thanks for telling me that because now I'm going to show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, didn't so end, I didn't end up actually moving to New York till I was 24. So when when I got back actually um, at 20, 20, yeah, I was still 20 at the time. Um, when I got back from my internship in New York, it's, it's a known story but not known um that i uh had lyme disease for seven years oh wow um undiagnosed wow. so when it originally hit me when i was 20 um it didn't get diagnosed wow. till I was 27, but because of that i ended up um actually my last year of university uh, i didn't even i barely went to class because i was so ill um so all the original plans of going to New York after school and all of that stuff kind of got put on the back burner on hold. Um, to just get my get my health back up. Um, well, so we just didn't know what was wrong. So it was just right going. So doctor. if you could take us back to like those couple of years where in your heart you knew where you wanted to be, but like the things around you and in, even in your physical body, in this case, were saying, no, you need to be here. Like, what was that? conflict like for you and how did you work through it it was extremely difficult um mostly because we didn't know what was happening and uh, and lyme disease is a, a very very brutal autoimmune sort of disease that makes you know it masks in so many other ways so i mean i was so young and being tested for you know by the time I was 21, I was like being tested for cancer. I was being tested for MS. Wow. Um, 
They thought I had a rare brain disease that only six doctors in North America could diagnose. It was very difficult to not be able to do the things I wanted to do. Um, also, to sort of be known as a sick kid suddenly. Before this happened, I was never, ever, ever ill. Like right. I didn't get a cold, nothing. So to be such a productive person and then to not be able to do things, because in the first two and a half years of Lyme, so from 20 to like almost 23, it was extremely cute. So I could wake up and sleep for 10 hours, wake up, need to sleep again for four hours, wake up, need to sleep again. So I was sleeping like 18 hours a day. I couldn't. Wow. This is in the beginning or this is the end? Sorry. Yeah, this is like for, for about two years of it, um, okay. the beginning bits. And I, I couldn't get out of bed and my mom would have to feed me rice because I couldn't even lift a spoon. So there was no wow. option of me going to school. And because right. we didn't know you were what just was trying wrong. to survive. Yeah, and like because we didn't know what was wrong, I faked it to everybody. People would joke and be like, Oh, Tasha's so lazy, she's never coming. And I was like, Yeah, you know me, like, haha, yeah. good mornings and because what do you tell people? Like I'm sick. Right. I didn't know. But I also say Lyme taught me the greatest lessons of life. At my worst when I was lying there in pain and I, I really, really thought like this is how I'm gonna go because I was in such severe pain that feels like cancer. And so I remember reading Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. And I was 21 and reading this very, very, very deep book that made complete sense to me um, about who we truly are and, and how we're not our, our bodies and the titles and the things we do. And, and even all the things I was achieving at the end of the day wouldn't matter. And so what mattered was like, being in the present, living your life, mm -hmm. being kind to the people around you, because they're the ones who are going to show up for you. You know, all those very yeah. deep life lessons have always stayed with me. And, and, and it, it's, oh, it just made me grateful. You know, I think the one great yeah. thing he says in that book is what sickness does to you is it quiets your mind because you don't have energy to think about silly things. Which is 100% right. true, because at that time, right. I had no no energy to think about anything negative. And it was just a focus on like being positive. And then the days I felt good, I used those days to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why even now, a lot of people say, they're like, how come you're always like doing stuff? <laughs> and I'm like, because I feel good. And you don't understand yes. what it feels like to not feel good. Um, yeah. So days I do, I'm like, well, let's just go. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So like you're you're like every day is is an opportunity because you know what it feels like to not know if if, if you have to tomorrow. Know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, and it sounds so cliche because people say that, but I'm I yeah. but I'm just like, no, really, like you have no idea <laughs> um, <laughs> what it feels like to not be able to you know, I had to leave. And so actually after university, I did get a job. I, I got a job right right after school. I graduated, got my first job, which is now at Blue Ant Media on a show called Collector Showdown. And I would go to work and it was in North York and I was living in Mississauga, which was like 45 minutes away. I would drive to work, not understand how I got there and then not be able to drive back because the exhaustion wow. of the and then my parents would have to come and and take me back. I get and, you. Yeah, and that just became oh, wow. unfortunate. It became too often that when they wanted to renew my contract, I I had to say no because I right. wasn't able to. You know. So so that lasted for five years. Seven years. Wow. Yeah, but eventually once. Uh, it's an interesting thing what happens is like you hit sort of a threshold, like when the doctors finally told me, you know, in two and a half years, I never really got upset about it. That's the weird thing when I look back is a lot of people thought that I would be depressed and whatever. I just sort of pushed through because I didn't know what was wrong. And I was like, right. I don't know, until something comes up, I just got to keep moving forward. So keep going, yeah. But when they said I might have a rare brain disease was the very first time I had a nervous breakdown. And that was the only right. time. And then when they finally said I didn't, I was like, cool, I'm living okay, my cool. life. And that's how I, got I actually <laughs> moved to New York is like, a lot of people ask me, like, how did your Indian conservative parents, because, you know, I was a very sheltered kid. 
how did they let you go? And it, I think it was because they saw me go through that, that they were like, let her live. Right. Right. When I moved to New York at 24 with two bags of clothes, um, mm. no job, no visa. I had my contacts there, but, and everybody was like, come here and we'll figure it out. And I was like, cool. And I just went on a bus, on a mega bus to New York. And, um, and then I got there August 2008. In September 2008, they announced a recession. <laughs> and I was like, great. Yeah. Every single person I knew lost their job. Um, like all the executives. So it was, you know, again, starting wow. from scratch. But at this point, I was like, I'm not going to give up. I'm here. So yeah. So what were, what were the, what was your like daily hustle like in, in that year? Like what did you do to stay inspired and stay like chin up, keep it going? Oh man, I don't know. Sometimes I think it was. But I, I think it was just a drive that that I was going to prove to everybody and myself that I could do this. There wasn't an option, also, to be honest with you, to come back home. And my parents yeah. told me that they they never said like, "Hey, you can come back." And I had had sort of a little bit of a tumultuous relationship with my dad at the time, which we're amazing now. But you know that young sort of angst, and we had our, totally. we had our bit. So it wasn't an option for me to to return home, and so I had to make it work. And sometimes I look back, I'm like, how the hell did I last that first year? Because it was such a bad point in the economy that all those things you watch and read about were real. Like I remember going to Times Square and a man with his whole body against the window of the Lehman, the the Lehman Brothers building, which was um, mm -hmm. just shut down. And of course he didn't fall because it was a glass, it was a glass wall, but I saw him being like, Oh my God, this is real. And nobody would even hire me under the table. I was like, I'll serve tables for like, I'll serve food for you. And they're like, no, I'm like, I don't get it. How come you're hiring that guy? <laughs> Not me. But I actually right. took it eventually as like a, a sign from, from God. Like it was something that I'm so glad didn't happen because if I had been distracted and comfortable, I'm I might have not I might not have pushed. So every day was like sending out resumes, coming up with ideas, going to, you know, work on my visa. At the time I started creating a blog and just finding whatever creative outlets I could find and any potential job that I could survive with. And then eventually I got a job at Bryant Park once I got my visa. So once I got there, like six months in, I got my O one one visa. Wow. Yeah. And did you get that through the relationships that you had previously, even though things were shifting? Yes. How did you? Yeah. So it was uh, it's a great question. Um, my O one, one I was lucky that I did not get sponsored by a specific company. So I wasn't tied to anybody. Um, I got my O one one through some very known lawyers and um, I got it as a result of my past work. And uh, cool. and I, I had great executives from NBC and MTV and all these places that knew me. Um, How and, you, yeah, yeah, and so they wrote me a ton of letters, and um, and I literally submitted a 600-page application. Wow. And again, I got lucky in that a lot of the things I had worked on before, like the the documentary at, uh, at Rogers, actually won a national and international TV award um, for Rogers. Amazing. And uh, you know, a lot of the shows I worked on at CBC or even Blue Ant, like they did really well, and so. I got lucky to be aligned with the right things. And so I was early on. The pain. Yeah. Yeah. And that was from just working on everything, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Saying yes. yeah. So you're, you're in New York. You, sorry, where did you get your first gig? Brian yeah, Park. It was Brian Park what, PR. <laughs> PR marketing for Brian Park's, uh, they they do an event every Christmas called the Holiday Shops at Bryant Park, yeah. and so I was the PR marketing uh, coordinator head basically for that, wow. and it was amazing. It was the worst hours of my life, but, um, <laughs> and and because I was still ill at the time, and again we didn't know, and I didn't have insurance in America. Oh, I actually used to just set up a like doctor's appointments on like a Friday in Toronto 
and I would take a overnight bus, reach in Toronto, do my, my appointment, take wow. an evening bus, and come back straight into work on Saturday morning. So wow. it's kind of insane schedules. But you know, you so do. how did this? How did you then transition into creating your own content and starting to? What led you to create your own? content to write for yourself? Yeah, um, I really didn't think of it. To be honest, like that, I, I was still trying to after Brian Park, um, do a ton of interviews and trying to get into like a regular stable, like network job. And MTV really liked me, but the right opportunity wasn't showing up. And, and, you know, for two years, I was like interviewing, interviewing, interviewing. I was like, Oh, my God, with these guys, like, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> And then uh, it actually just it happened so quickly that I, I went in for an audition for an improv show and they were looking for, you know, a, an archetype on Hollywood characters. And so one was a socialite. And so then they were like, come in as like and create a character. And I was like, well, I'm Indian. So it has to be a justified character. So I created um, right. an Indian socialite. And I, and I thought, who, who who would be a funny Indian socialite? And I said, oh my God, the most famous Indian is Deepak Chopra. And uh, at least yeah. then in America. And so I was like, oh my God, how yeah. funny if Deepak Chopra had a socialite daughter. Like it's such a, like an opposite. <laughs> um, and so I went in there and I did this we- weird character. I don't think they got it. And um, afterwards I was like, this I, this character is amazing. And like her whole vision and her whole life like flashed in my eyes. And so when I couldn't get a job, one of my friends encouraged me. He's like, why don't you just write this and make this as a series? And I was like, what does that mean? And how do I do that? I'm in this other country and I don't, I don't even have a camera. I don't know anybody here. And he was my one, he's still one of my really dear friends. um, And he's like, I'll arrange it for you. And I said, all right. He goes, just write. And I said, okay. And so I just started writing. And then in a month, I made, you know, my first comedy web series, which was Mumbai Chopra, or it used to be called Landing in Mumbai. And I made, eventually made three seasons of it. But that first season came out and it did really well. And the head of Viacom HR saw it. And then a job wow. happened to open up as a digital producer at MTV or MTV News, and I was just applying and didn't think it was a fit. And I was like, hey, what do you think about this? And she's like, oh, my God, you'd be perfect. And and she had seen Mumbai, and so, like, it landed me that, my first job there. And then I was at MTV for four years, and I got a first-look deal at Viacom because of that. And that sort of just kick-started all the, like, create-your-own-content stuff, you know? Right. But I was always like a medium well, person. I think, so I always like, I, I had done a blog already. And then I was like, all right, I'm done with that. Like YouTube's becoming a thing. So then I was like, YouTube. <laughs> and now like, you know, this like podcast, like podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that there's so much to unpack in just the last like minute of everything that you said. But I think the, the biggest overall arc is the weaving that happened. And that if you would have said no to this opportunity, you know, if you would have just stopped when MTV was like, we don't really have a place for you and they dragged you along and you would have just kept waiting for that, it may have never happened. But because you took the ownership and the responsibility and you continued using your artistic voice, it, it came back around. And I think that's a huge point to zero in on instead of sitting around and waiting what can you do now you know is the conversations I'm trying to have with these 18 to 20 something yeah, you know like what can you mm-hmm. do and right Oprah, now you know I think she puts it well she goes luck is hard hard work meets opportunity and um and I got lucky yeah. but I was working at the time and I was doing stuff and I had no ego about it and and yet I tried to if I applied for something I made sure it was a fit I didn't just apply like Right. you know, blinders on like, oh, cool, hire me for anything. I, I really applied for things right. that I thought could be a fit. I took a shot with the the digital producing one. Everything else sounded good, but I was like, I don't know, like, what does it mean to code a video? And I didn't know if I right. could learn that, but she believed I could learn that. And she was like, no, you got this, like, cool. And yeah, so I, I just tell people like all, all of my all of my jobs, to be honest, didn't, they didn't happen right away. Like even Rogers, I knocked on their door and they said no. And then I was like, okay, cool. Well, like, uh, I'll be back. Right. But somebody phoned. 
you know, and then <laughs> even yeah. my job at Maker Studios Disney happened that way. You know, I originally had a meeting a year and a half before I actually got the job. And, and same thing, they were just like, we really like you. And I kept coming in for things. And I was like, all right. And I just sort of gave up. And then it only happened because I sent a happy Thanksgiving message to one of their heads. And I literally yeah. was like, hey, no, you know, something you also have to build genuine relationships and not ask for anything. And yeah. so I really sent a message saying yeah. happy Thanksgiving. And then he's like, oh, shit, I have something for you. Send me your stuff <laughs> now. And I was like, okay. And I still was like, yeah, sure, sure. Wow. Like, who knows? And it took about a month. And I then love, I got my job there. Wow. I love that. Building genuine relationships without wanting anything. Yeah, anything. that's a hard, hard thing for people. I mean, eventually, look, we're, we're mm -hmm. all there to support support each other. Um, if somebody asks me who's a friend of mine, like I will always help. But to be a friend of somebody for something isn't the right way to approach it. Um, and there are people who do that. And I think anybody who has half a brain can see through it. So don't, exactly. you know, I tell people don't ever network, do not network, build friendships. That's it. And that means there are going to be people who are big in the industry that you will vibe with. There'll be people who are big in the industry that you won't vibe with, but don't be fake about mm -hmm. vibing with the person that you don't vibe with just to get ahead because right. it likely won't right. work out anyways. Yeah. And you, you might miss the, the big opportunity where you do get along exactly. with someone very well. Yeah. So uh, is Disney what brought you to LA no. or how did you make it? Yeah, that's a LA? great question. I actually uh, lost my job at MTV. So we had layoffs. And uh, every year around the same time, they had layoffs. And so this time, um, I was one of the people let go. And I was devastated. <laughs> I mean, I've been there for four sure. years. It, well, it was funny. They, they hired me right back um, as a freelancer, though. But uh, that's another part of the story. Um, mm. But I was devastated. And I was like, oh, my God. I had wanted to move to L.A. a few months before that. And that I, I knew sort of put me on the edge with them because – they weren't able to give me a transfer at the time, but I was still like, um, I was healthier, but the job was so extremely stressful at MTV where I was working, I was working um, night shift in news. So I was working 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. every single day, um, most of my weekends, almost every holiday. I, if I got a day off, it was like a, a giant, huge thing. I really, really, really worked myself almost to death where the doctors were yeah. like, you're going to, something's going to happen to you if you don't like chill. And wow. so I needed to go to LA because I knew that the lifestyle was a little different and, um, but they weren't, uh, it would just wasn't, they weren't able to do that time. So then I got laid off and then I was really upset. Rightfully is my first time getting laid off. And, right. uh, and it's not a personal thing. Laying off is not like a firing. But still, I was like, oh, my God, how could this happen? What am I going to do? I'm going to find a job. And then my right. mom actually um, – and it happened actually a day before I was – I had a planned trip to L.A. anyways. And so then I came to L.A., spent two weeks. And then my mom's like – you know, she she taught me very well to, to adapt to situations. And sometimes so so-called bad things are good things for you. And you don't see it because you, mm -hmm. you're not yes anding life, you know? Um, it's a very improv thing. Like, just say yes yeah. and add something to it. So he made me accept, yeah. all right, you got laid off, but you have a severance. So instead of using it to waste money in New York where you don't want to be, why don't you just move to L.A.? And I was like, Ma, how am I going to do that? Like, sell everything? I've been in New York now <laughs> for years. And I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, sell it. And I'm like, what? And I did. I came back <laughs> in two weeks. I sold my entire life in New York and said goodbye to my best friends. I made a giant party. And then I came again with two bags on a plane this time to L.A. <laughs> um, same sort of situation where I lived with a friend for what I thought would be two weeks and it turned into a year. But they had, they had a, a second bedroom. Um, and it was like weird because I was like, oh, my God, I'm starting again. But I was only yeah. unemployed for three weeks. I got here and I got, uh, people found out that I was here. At that point, I'd had a good reputation. And so I got my job at uh, Fox's Utopia 
because it was run by some former MTVers. They hired me for that. And then I worked on that for six, seven months when uh, until that show got canceled. And same thing again. I was like, well, I'm not going to freak out. What am I going to do? And I was just sending Thanksgiving messages to people. And then the maker thing happened and a, month, a month later. That's I got into how, maker, right. So. so were you writing on the side throughout this whole time, like for your projects or did like, were you still doing? Yeah, I was Mumbai, Mumbai, doing Mumbai for like, three years. So I did that till actually just until I started uh, until I moved to LA was our last season came out when I was here um, so that was 2014 and then somebody who had seen me do that uh, some CEO of like a it's so funny of a trash can company but it's like a big trash can company saw that and asked me to create a branded web series for him for for the trash can and so I wow. created a a three episode series called Can for them, which again, back in the day, branded cool. series weren't yet a thing. And now they're such a huge, everybody's right. doing branded content. And so I think only BuzzFeed was doing it at that time. And so I did that. And yeah, in the meantime, I'm always, I've, I was always writing, I was always creating different ideas. Um, it's just all, it's just like sort of who I am. Like, I don't, I don't know how not to. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's therapy. just like my mind goes somewhere. I see something and I'm like, oh, this. And, oh, this. Yeah. I've always been studying yeah. in the meantime. I was doing classes at UCB and, you know, just always trying to keep my mind sharp and knowing what's going on. When, at what point did you feel like you, you had a clear direction over your professional career and development? Like where, was there a moment or has it, been an ebb and flow and evolution of new directions. I've always known that I wanted to be in entertainment and that I wanted to be a creator. I think my struggle was always like, what was that person called? You know, because I think mm. my peers all wanted the sort of traditional thing. You know, so one person just wanted to be a writer. One right. person just wanted to be a producer. One person just wanted to be an actor. And my idols were Oprah, Tina Fey, Mindy Kaling. Like people that to me were the epitome of all of it. They were producers. They were writers. They were actors. They were creators, right. you know. And so I struggled. My struggle over the years was like, where do I fit in? And that only happened in the last couple of years where I finally owned that I'm a creator. And um, mm. and that took me a long time just to like say those words because over the years, everybody asked me if I, if I did, if I was a, you know, a producer at MTV, people would be like, oh, okay. So you're just a producer now? Like what happened to the acting? Huh? I'm like, well, right. well I'm acting right. in Muga and I'm acting right. in other things and you know, and then they then I'd act, and they'd be like, "Okay, so you're, so you're just an actor now, like, so you don't you don't want to produce?" And I'm like, right. huh? And I and people are all even to this day, people always <laughs> say it to me, they're like, "So what do you want to do the most?" I'm like, "Why does that matter?" Right. <laughs> everything. Well, also, I, I just want feel everything. like it's such an yeah. grandma way of thinking because I'm Doesn't like, matter, yeah. nobody now does one thing. And would you ask Oprah, like, what's the one thing that you do, Oprah? Yeah. Um, it's a silly question because every celebrity, every celebrity, once they make it as an actor, what's the next thing that they do? They try to produce their own content. What's the next thing that they do? They try to direct their own features. Right. Then what's the next thing they do? They try to write something. It's just that right. I'm trained in all those things already. Yeah. So I don't feel like I've ever had to choose. Yes. I, it just depends on my mood. So now I do the podcast and it was funny because right. yesterday a friend of mine, I had uh, a meeting with just like catching up and he said to me, so like you're just doing the audio thing now, so like you don't want to do video. I was just like laughed. I was like, you know, I'm just one person. Like I can't do everything at one time. <laughs> yeah. Super, super woman. Um, I guess my next question would be, what is your advice to the 22 year old who like wants to know the one thing that they're supposed to do in their life? So stressful and they just want their life to mean something. What would you tell them? I think I got very lucky knowing what I wanted to do early on. It was by the time I was seven, I knew I'm going to be in entertainment. It was originally as an actor and then 
and all of that has evolved and I'm still an actor, but I do a lot of other things. And so I, I, it gave me direction when I was picking programs or classes in school and high school to university to after. And the only thing I can tell people is like the way I knew what I wanted to do was I followed my joy. And my joy was mm. in making people laugh. My joy was in entertaining them with a story. Mm. My joy came in creating something, even for me, the imagination. Like I was a big reader um, as a kid. So my mind was like always just coming up with things. And even now people joke, they're like, you have a really overactive imagination. Um, it's like dark, but it's like, it's like, I'm always <laughs> like, I think the, I can come up with like the best horror movie because I have like the most overactive imagination. You know, there's a great quote that always inspired me. Um, and I'm just paraphrasing it, but it just says, where your passion meet the needs of the world, therein lies your vocation. So find the thing that wow. makes you happy. Find what maybe the world needs in that space and find a way to marry the two. You know, and if that's even, you know, it, and a lot of people like general things. They're like, oh, well, I just like, I like sports. So learn different aspects of sports. If, if, and look, we all have limitations, right? If you can't all be the the best athlete right. or or you can't all be like a professional baseball player but you really love baseball well what are other areas of baseball that you really love that you could you could you know you could learn about can you work for a baseball team can you um, become a manager can you you know there's like so many millions and millions of ways to do the yeah. thing that you love to do and just not be attached to like all this like bullshit sorry my my language I don't even know if I can talk on this no, forget you're all the things yeah, that people yeah. tell you about <laughs> money and fame and like the only thing that matters is the stuff that deals with the masses because it's not true. There are so many mm -hmm. celebrities that mm -hmm. appeal to masses that have no value. Okay. So like that's not where value 100%. is created. Value can yeah. be created in a simple thing as teaching somebody how to, you know, I, I danced for 10 years. And yes. I taught dance for 10 years during all of this time. I was working, I was doing what I was doing for 10 years. Wow. And I was a frontline dancer of a major dance company. And in hindsight, the only thing I miss the most is teaching. Because those kids are still my students. Wow. I've helped some of them get into university. I've helped, you know, they all look at me like a big sister. Like I taught some of them since they were four and a half. If I died tomorrow, I could just say, Hey, you know what? I touched one person's life. That's all that matters. Yeah. You know how hard it is to do that? People need to get yeah. out of this like mentality of s some mass success. And Eckhart Tolle talks about it a lot about being a frequency yeah. changer. That, you know, there are people like when you meet them, the blessing they give to the world is like by making you smile that day. And that changes the frequency right. of the entire world because your mood has now mm. changed into something more positive. So if you could just even do that with, with what you're doing, that's it. And I think that is so good, period. I think that just even presenting yourself and your attitude and your frequency at, from an I can, or I can do this, I can add this, I can, instead mm -hmm. of what you can't do, or what is in the way of you getting what you want. I think people think that it's just gonna be easy, and that if it's not easy, that it's not for me. And that is not the case at all. I mean, just in your story alone, like how many times was there a blockage up in your face and you had to figure out how to work around it to not let that stop you from continuing on, you know, not even just arriving at a specific point, but yeah. just continuing on. Yeah. I, you know, I Keep try going. to tell when I've talked to young people, I tell them, you know, when people are like, oh, well, oh, my life is really hard. I tell them, like, you know, I came from a dysfunctional family where there was domestic abuse and everything. I faced Lyme disease for seven years. I was in an abusive relationship where I was literally, like, broken into nothing uh, for two years. I then, I, and my first year in, in America, I tell them, like, you know how much I lived on and survived? $11,000 my first year in America. I don't know how I survived in New York City. I in don't know New York how I survived, City. but I did. And that's not wow. asking anybody for money. I never asked my parents for money. They never gave me money. That never happened. I then when everything was fine, when I got to Disney, I got in a car accident that gave me a head injury and a full like severe whiplash, a, 
a severe like mild traumatic brain injury and I was out for 15 months again where I couldn't even read so uh-huh. I tell people I'm like and it's hard sometimes I've looked back and like yeah you're human you go through human emotions of like man why me why did this happen oh the things I could have done but then you also go all right mm-hmm. well I can't change that but what I can change is like how I continue to go on and you're just going to realize that like being in a negative space or thinking that things shouldn't happen to you is a waste of your time and your time is better spent just being more uh, a little bit logical about it and being like all right well I can't change that so let's just move forward and learning that all those things can change you and move you like I can't be here sitting with you talking about this in a way to encourage people if those things didn't happen to me Right. Just the power of your story. Everybody has a story and everybody has the power to, to make their story mean something. That was my only goal in my life. I was like, cool, I'm going to go through shit and it's fine. I'm going to make it matter. And I'm not a jaded person. People who meet me, I'm like, I have been cheated on by more boyfriends than I've been in a relationship with me. And I've never done it. (laughs) I have been in an abusive relationship. I won't do it to anybody. People are like, well, don't you get jealous or whatever? I'm like, no, man, I give people free reign. Do you, be you, like whatever, you know? And, And I won't get, when the world tries to like, if you feel like the world is trying to bring you down, why let it win? But it's not. It, the world's not trying to bring you down. It's just trying to teach you. <laughs> and being yeah. open and, and just listening to to it, to what's coming yeah, at I'm you. Fine. All of it. Yeah, 100%. So you're at Disney. You left Disney. Yeah, How did you get so, to where you are today? Uh, again, fun story. Um, the Disney uh, acquired Maker Studios um, in one of the largest acquisitions. So we became a Disney company. Um, but it, we already knew that Disney was... Uh, uh, absorbing us and so then they had a giant layoff where they laid off 75 percent of the company including all my bosses and everybody so wow about yeah about 75 wow. percent of the company was laid off sort of a mass exodus last year and uh again in sort of a way i i was like what am i gonna do what do i want to do uh, but the good thing for me at that point was i had spent so many of my years working at networks that i realized i don't want to do this right now and so uh, again, I just sort of pivoted. I took time. I traveled. I went around, um, and I realized like I just want to create my own projects, and I want to freelance. And um, some of that, because as I've grown older, different things are priority and value to me. And right now, like for me to be with my family is really important. For me to take care of my health is very, very, very important. You know, after going through seven years of that and then basically two years of like a car accident thing all I need is like to feel good yeah Uh, Yeah. it gave me a a great time and so now I am uh, developing my own uh, slate of series while I still freelance as a producer Um, so I have a scripted series that I've finished and I'm shopping Um, I have two unscripted series that I'm shopping one which is already getting like quite a bit of attention and then um, I uh, continue the podcast. It kept me going. It's amazing, by the way. I think it's such a it's such a space. It's just relevant and needed because dating is so hard. You know, I, I've had like a, a solid relationship for since I've been uh, just in college. But like my sister, totally different experiences. And you know, it's like. Yeah, and I was just about to be like, what's that like? You had you know? a solid relationships in college? <laughs> I feel like yeah, you're the anomaly I know. now. I, know. Um, I can't believe it. You're the anomaly I, now. I, I, yeah, I know. And it was, I mean, really quickly, like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I grew up from, like, I had instant stability at home like my parents were divorced they they got remarried they um got divorced again it was just like a lot and so I knew that when I found someone if I found someone I just wanted to like work it out with them and uh it's amazing yeah I think yeah the the reason like I created the show was I don't personally I don't want to say uh, wary to say I don't like uh, most dating experts because they're never people who've like gone through anything in life And then I think that a lot of people give you this like very blanket Mm -hmm. cookie cutter advice uh, that's like just not realistic. Um, Our show is like, I'm not here to give you advice. I don't want to tell you what to do. But what I will do is like the crux of what kind of dating is, is what Rumi, um, there's a poet named Rumi who says, uh, 
Yeah, right. And he says, yeah, um, sorry, it's not your task to seek for love. It is your task to uh, seek out all the barriers you've built against it. So in every episode, we'll break down one dating topic mm. and ask a lot of the whys. Like, why are we doing this thing? So that you can apply it to your own life. Because I can't guarantee you, you know, there are people that are d- dating experts like, I'll guarantee you find your man. I'm like, that's not possible. You don't know what life has and their destiny has in store for <laughs> yeah. them. Like, but what you can do is empower them right. to get out of their own way and be open so that if they do meet the right person, whenever that is, they will welcome it and they won't fuck it up. <laughs> right. You know? Because once you've been scarred so much, it's I am I can imagine and I've witnessed it's hard to open up when you do see the right that right exactly. person. Exactly. And I know it's um, right going person. through my own thing, which is <laughs> yeah. which is the reason I took this on. I was like, okay, I've gone through a lot of the I've been I was a relationship girl and then I became the commitment phobe and then I now the reformed commitment phobe, you know? And so it's easy mm-hmm. for me, like it's funny because a lot of people like if I ask myself, I'm like, why am I single? It's like I can now spot it so easily in other people. That's like, I, I like, ba- like, I know before they know that they're not ready. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, right. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man, I love it. Well, so great to yeah. have you. We just, just one last thing that I like to finish up is just, I call them rev moments. Like, you know, it could be something that you're dreaming of, something that's getting you pumped this week. You know, what is like a rev moment that you, you're going into next week oh, with or um, finishing I this week. I have been uh, producing an amazing series um, called All Work, No Play uh, with uh, for some big gaming influencers, Critical Role, um, and it's on Twitch and YouTube. Our final shoot is on Monday, so I am pushing through this week for that, okay. and uh, I am so mm-hmm. excited, uh, one, to like wrap out, which has been an amazing show. Honestly, it's been one of the most fun shows a talent is like the kindest humans I've ever met. Um, but I'm also just excited to, to mm. check out for the rest of the year because um, I'm going to uh, India and then back to Toronto um, for literally from like Thanksgiving wow. till the new year. I was like, this is the best part of freelance life that I was like, I am tapping out and I am done. Yeah. I worked really, really hard the last few months and good I'm good. Good for you. <laughs> kind of dating. Yeah, wherever, wherever people get their podcasts um, are on, on all the major podcast platforms. Amazing. Your uh, Instagram for kind of dating are... is at kind of dating across the board, and I'm at Natasha Chandel on Facebook and Instagram, and Natasha underscore Chandel on Twitter. Perfect. Well, thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you so much for having us, me. It's such a great show. Thank you guys so much for listening and tuning in to the Sarah Brinson podcast. I appreciate it so much, and I love hearing all of your feedback um, and the overwhelming response to the podcast in general. If you would, please like, subscribe, and review the podcast on iTunes, share with your friends, and send us feedback, who you want to hear on the podcast, topics that you would love to cover, and we'll do our best to incorporate those into this season. Guys, have an amazing week. Stay inspired, inspire others, and I will catch you next week.